three of our presenters for their enlightening talks. I'd like to invite you up to receive questions from the audience. And to our audience, I kindly ask that you phrase your inquiries in the form of questions. And we have some time, so um, please. Uh, we have dinner and the keynote lectures as well as our first of two films later on. On the schedule, it says at 7.30 is when the dinner is at the Bridges Theatre, which is a three-minute walk from here. It's on campus. However, due to the uh, foresight of some members of the organizing committee, we have decided to push the time to 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock is when the dinner begins, and you're all welcome to, 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 to join us. There should be enough food for most, most people, and certainly, uh, if there isn't, I will volunteer my plate. Uh, so, uh, that's all, it's at the Bridges Theatre. So, I don't think I forgot anything else. Let's proceed with the question. You know, it will be at 8.30 and the film will be at 9.30. Alright, questions? The question is uh, to Melanie. Uh, I'd like to know if there was a French, I mean a Jewish connection to Werfel's uh, interest in the Musada, 40 days of Musada. Uh, this, this came later. Werfel is Jewish himself. And uh, he, he wrote it um, until he published it in '33, and so it was a, like a presentiment of things will, that will come. But he knew not that the Jewish fate will, will be out, uh, will, be, will, be, will be like that. Just he is Jewish, and the Jewish persecutions in Germany began in '33, and even before, but '33. The book was published and banned and burned uh, several weeks after the publishing. So um, it just uh, was in, in time to, for, for, but it was yeah, yeah, by, um, by, by chance. So. Plus the 40 days of Musadal, as most people know, was the most checked out book from the library of the Warsaw Ghetto. So there is that connection. Thank you very much for all three. Um, this question is Dr. Aslanian. Um, the Trieste uh, schism is uh, very interesting the way you presented it. It raises also questions in my mind. Uh, were these two priests um, ever taken back into the church? And if they were not, how did they recruit new priests in Trieste who later went to Vienna? Um, so it's, you know, it's my question that the fact that two excommunicated priests could in fact continue and establish a branch of the Mokhitarist order is uh, it's fascinating. I'd like to have a little information if you have. That's an excellent question. I actually I um, don't know enough about this at this moment, but all I can tell you is the excommunication from the Venetian Patriarch may not have uh, been honored in neighboring Trieste, which was a rival political center. Uh, beyond that, um, I think I'm going to, uh, to sit on this one and after, my, after I do further research, I'll be in a better position to answer it. The question is to many, many, if you know any Armenian uh, philologists who graduate from German universities, very famous Armenians, do you know them? I want to tell the Karakin of the pianist graduates from German yeah, universities. Yeah, they are theologians. They uh, yeah, and you were, he was a disciple from uh, Adolf von Harnack. So there were uh, this philological um, trade between Germans and Armenians and also in theology. There were, um, there were scholars, Armenian scholars, doing the study in, in Berlin, mostly in Berlin. And this was the other von Hanna connection. Uh, 
very quick uh, linguistic questions. Uh, several. Is it true that uh, Casanova spoke Armenian? No. No, I'm glad you asked that question. I was bracing myself for that. There are many, many rumors and myths about Casanova's identity that I would take this opportunity of disabusing you from. So, I can tell you for certain, well, almost for certain, as certain as, global, uh, as climate change is climate change, I can tell you that <laughs> Casanova, uh, it has been argued, is of Armenian origin, blah, 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 and that the, the name Casanova is related to Nora Dungian, and about which the only thing I can tell you with absolute certainty is yes, it's a fact that Zakaria Noradung or Noradungian, one of the earliest supporters of Abbot Mahitar, and in fact someone who supported him when Mahitar was still in Morea, and who died in Venice in 1717 and is buried at his tombstone, I can show you later on if you'd like, in the Santa Croce Church. Zakaria Noradungian's family and his descendants switched their name. Even Zakaria himself in his will uses the translation of Noradungian as Casanova, New House. However, that does not necessarily Casanova, uh, make Casanova an Armenian, the Giacomo Casanova we know of. And the logic I can tell you is, if Casanova was an Armenian based on the similarity of the names, then Minas Pejeshkian, whose name has been mentioned earlier, who was known in Venice to many people as Minas di Medici, would be a descendant of the Medici dynasty, and he's not. <laughs> So, uh, there's absolutely no connection. You do not speak Armenian. He had a history of working for the Venetian Senate way before Trieste. In fact, he was a spy, a secret agent for the Inquisitori in London in, 16, in 1767, five years before. And he was the one who approached. The Venetians did not approach him on the basis of him being Armenian. That's a myth. Okay, the next very, very quick question is in the printed books on the Title pages. At what date do they regularize the orthography for Venedic? Because in the early text it's e e, and in the later text it becomes yech yech. I can see your question, and I can raise you uh, by telling you that uh, the there has been a puzzle that I have myself not been able to resolve, nor has, nor has anyone. So I welcome any contributions. The ter the word for Venedic used by the Mahitarists in the 1600s, in the early 1700s, as far as I can tell, is either Venej or Vehesh. I have seen Vehesh all the time in the manuscripts. And there is no definition anywhere in any of the dictionaries of that. The only conclusion I can make is that it's an Armenian equivalent of Chita in Krita or Serenissima. I'm not sure. That Those are guesses. But beyond that, Venej, maybe Vehesh, but Benedict, I don't know when it was. But I'd like to talk to Father Vaughan and Father Vaughan later on. So. I have a question for Cebu and one for Balint. For uh, Professor Zalian, uh, I'd like to know more about the economic connection between uh, Giovanni de Serpos and the Mercatorist Order. So this money which was lent to him uh, for interest it was even for what purpose we do. Yeah, yeah. and for Balint, uh, you talk about Kachatur at Zomitzi, but he was not a guitarist, he was a friend of the guitar. But uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, Karl Freud, Friedrich Neumann said that his works in, in Armenian were ridiculous. So I, I'm, surprised, I'm, I'm surprised because he was always praised by the congregation, etc. So if you have looked at his works, are they ridiculous or not? Thank you. What was your question to me again? Sorry. You didn't. <laughs> the money of Serpos, yes. Serpos. Uh, the, uh, the short answer is, I don't know, but I can tell you that uh, the only place I've, I've seen references to Serpos being the person who was loaned this huge sum of 100,000 piastres. Uh, the place where I've seen the reference is in Casanova's volume, as well as in the uh, Viennese State Archives, which has two volumes of 1,450 pages 
on the Trieste faction from 1749 to 1809. And I believe the only, one of the few people in the world who's seen this is none other than Balint, because I believe I saw your name in the, uh, in the page where you have to register your name when you consult the document. So, uh, State Archives of Vienna. Uh, it's a two volume, 1450, 1450 pages. There, there you find the reference to Serbos. Uh, I've also come across in the footnotes of Casanova's uh, volumes by the translators who are not always very well informed that Giovanni di Serpo supposedly was the brother-in-law of uh, Stepanos Melkonian. I cannot really uh, affirm that. I was stunned or surprised. If there's any factual evidence for that, I'm always interested. I've read the same thing in, a, in an report for the Holy Office. I don't know oh, if it's true. Okay. I, so I, I found the same thing. That's that, uh, an element of intrigue, even more intrigue than so, so answer your question. Um, I uh, read the letters from Hachatur, or, um, or as you might see, and the letters are everything in or every letters are in Latin, yeah, and uh, it's a very nice script and with a nice Latin, so good. And I never read the books, but the books are like theological books. For me, as for a historian, the books were. <laughs> Uh, not so much interested as the letters, yeah, the, the letters, so I, I cannot ans un uh, answer your question. I, I read also from from, um, the, from Neumann, yeah, that, that, that uh, his, uh, his uh, knowledge in the Armenian is very curious and very weak, and yeah, um, but, but uh, I didn't uh, read the books, I didn't read the books, but the, the, and the letters are uh, all in Latin language. I have two questions. Um, the first about the geopolitics, Venice, Trieste. If I understood right, the authorities in Venice picked up these two monks and said, go, the you know, early days of deportation. And they decided to take them to Trieste, where, which is a rival port. And yet, we have jurisdiction enough to go dump them there and leave them there and assume all as well. A little more about the geopolitics. The second question is one of huge academic significance. The Hotel Danielli in Venice, who did it used to belong to? I can answer both questions, I think, fairly confidently. The, the reason why, well, uh, only, only Diodato Babic was taken to Trieste. Minas Kasparian was actually taken to Trento. Little did the Inquisition and the Senate know that the two had an agreement somehow that they would end up meeting each other in Trieste. Uh, but of course, your question still remains in effect as to why would the Venetian authorities dump uh, Diodato Babic in the rival port, given that he could actually pose significant threats to them or be a menace of some sort. And the only answer to that is I would assume they would have thought the excommunication of the two monks, including Babik, would have prevented and prevented them from pursuing the uh, trade of the of the cloth, so to speak. I'm not sure. Uh, your second question. The important academic one, Hotel Danieli. Hotel Danieli. Uh, Hotel Danieli also has certain aura of myth around it, but I think it's more or less verified that. Before it became a hotel in the early 1800s, uh, it used to belong to the Sherimanyan family as a warehouse for their goods. Uh, I have not seen the actual smoking gun document in the archive, but I don't have any reason to doubt the veracity of this claim. But it became a hotel much after the last Sherimanyan had already uh, become Tsurvads to the point where there was almost no recognition of him being a Shady Manian or a uh, And it is one of the nicest hotels in the world. It's a great place to have a cocktail. Anyone can have it, even for the same price as the price charged outside in regular cafes in Venice. Uh, short two short questions, in fact. Uh, first, to uh, Cebu again. Cebu, you promised some considerations on the reasons of the schism, and then you should try. Uh, 
number one and uh, two, Balin Kovac. Balin, please tell us a, a few words about the moment when, at the beginning of the 7th century, or is there something that I didn't understand probably? The moment when the Armenians in Transylvania turn to Catholicism. Okay, so the, uh, the question about the, re the actual reasons for the schism uh, is a difficult one to answer. I can tell you that there are two schools of thought on this question. The first school is the school of Ormanian, and it's the school to which our Reverend uh, His Excellency the Archbishop appears to be known to as well, which basically asserts that the schism was driven by theological and, un and ideological forces. That is to say that Mkhitar had two types of disciples. One faction was more Armenian and more in, in, in uh, after, the more, let's say, more convinced of the uh, orthodoxy of the Armenian church and so on. Another faction that was more pro-Roman or pro uh, uh, collegi, uh, collegist, or pro, let's say, pro propaganda fide, and anti armenian regard the Armenian church as a heretical institution. And the argument of Ormanian is that the two monks in question, Babik and Gasparian, belonged to the faction that was anti armenian or more pro-Roman, let's say, and that was what drove them to, uh, to the schism. The second school is the school that is uh, that belongs to Sargis Theodorian and to Hovannes Zavrian. And of course I'm using school here in quotation marks, there are no, there are no official schools, it's what we make them to be as historians and records. And that school argues that Ormania is essentially confusing effect with cause. So Zavrian argues, I think quite convincingly, that the effect of the schism was the theological difference that the Trieste faction only became an, more and more anti-Armenian in the sense of being more pro-Roman and more, uh, let's say, uh, to the point of uh, regarding the Armenian church as schismatic or heretical, only after the schism, as a kind of ideological justification, and not as a cause. Uh, I think there are good reasons for both uh, factors to be involved. I don't think it's a zero-sum game of one, only one, factor being the only explanatory factor here, because in the archives, in the Viennese archives, I'd say there are documents of a theological nature. But to what extent the theological arguments were more important than the personal, despotic, and money-related questions is one that I think would require a significant amount of research. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Uh, So the Armenians settled in the second part of the 17th century to Transylvania and in, in, um, in several weeks and already in the 90s they are Catholics. Yeah? So within a couple of decades they made the, the uh, church union yeah? in, in Lemberg and there is two theory, that one is the first bishop, the Minas, already signed the document or the second theory that Oxendio Vesilescu was the bishop who first signed. And, but already in the 90s, they are Catholics. The Shaharimanian family, uh, I've heard that they were the richest family in Europe uh, in the 18th century. What happened to their wealth? Um. I'm not so sure if they were indeed the richest family. I know that when they arrived in 1697 and permanently settled down in Venice, they were regarded as the Rothschilds of the Armenians as being among the richest families. I think the Venetian historian Berger uh, has written on this and said that they were uh, among the richest, if not the richest, family in Europe. What happened to their wealth? Like most Armenian wealth of the period, their wealth uh, evaporated uh, as a result of the absence of institutional mechanisms of generational or trans intergenerational uh, passing down. Uh, the family, the last Shedi Manyan that I know of, and I know, I know of him quite well actually because I looked at his grammar, his, his notebooks in the archives, is uh, Conte, I think, uh, 
the Fortunato Sheriman, interestingly the same name in Italian as the first Sheriman known in history, Murad Sheriman. Murad in Turkish and Arabic means uh, felicitous, happy, and so on. So the last one, with some poetic justice, was also named Fortunato. And he uh, he had an inkling of his Armenianness. I have his, I've seen his grammar books of learning Armenian and so on, but by the 1850s, there was no more trace of any Armenianness in whatever remaining members of the Sheriman family there were. Up until 6, 1790, we have letters in Armenian and Chova dialect written by Sheriman family members, but they had dissolved. Essentially, they became, uh, they accomplished their aim, which was immigration, integration, and success. And perhaps they're guilty of succeeding too much in this case. <laughs> are there any other questions? Thank you for your attention and engagement. So, seven o'clock, uh, Bridges Theater, James Bridges Theater, uh, literally 10 minutes walk from here. There will be cocktail party tables this high or so. I hope they're delivered, they were supposed to be delivered this morning. And there will be food for plenty of people. So, I welcome you there. And one last comment. The keynote addresses are in Armenian, as is befitting given the occasion that we have today, and they're by both uh, they're by two of the most important thinkers of the 20th century today alive. Uh, they're both from France, they're both Armenian. One is Krikor Belidian, the other one is my teacher Martin Shamian. For those who do not understand Armenian, I can promise to have their speeches ready in translation in English and either upload it to our university, to our chair's website, or certainly print it in the proceedings of this conference, which I'm very certain will be coming out in the next two, three years, two years at the most. So please join us. <laughs>